15. Would you stand, please? If you are 15, not 16, not 18, not 20, 15. Now look around you. I want you to know I was 15 years old when God called me to the ministry. Thank you. You may be seated. In fact, I was 15 years old the first time I ever did a live radio program. I had no idea what I was doing, but nobody cared. <laughs> I think it is so important for young people to have the opportunity to give what they have to the church and to the Lord Jesus as early as they can give it. And that's why Keswick has this youth night on Friday nights. Well, all week long we have been looking at the first century church, actually the churches of the first century, because we didn't look just at the Jerusalem church, we also looked at that Antioch church, which is a little further north from Jerusalem. And we've been noticing some of the impact that the first century church had without the image that we would expect them to have. The image of the church in the first century was not that good. In fact, there were people who hated them in the first century. The Jews did not like the church because they thought, thought that they had taken the Jewish religion and prostrated it. They thought they had destroyed it. They thought they had brought it down to the ground. The Romans didn't like the Christians because they were concerned that Jesus might stir up some trouble and get the Christians to form an army and march against Rome. In fact, the only one who seemed to love the first century Christians was God himself. And that's all it took. But within that first century, the real heroes of that century were not necessarily Paul and Peter and James and John. The real heroes of that century are the ones who stepped in to replace them because nothing is as good as it is unless when you are off the scene, it continues to go just like God wants it to. So Timothy was a young man. He stepped into a position of authority after studying under Paul. Mark was a young man who was a friend of Peter. And so the list goes on, and it's true in the Old Testament as well. I want to read to you from Joshua chapter 6 tonight. Don't bother to turn there. I'm just reading a couple of verses. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the country. Now you know the story, right? The two spies went in. He says to these two men, go into the harlot's house and bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. Now listen carefully. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all that she had. Did you notice that the two spies that went on this reconnaissance mission, this very, very dangerous mission, were two young men? You see, there comes a point in our lives when us old men have to say, God has a work for young men that we can no longer do. And we have to be willing to pass the baton on to younger people. And that's exactly what Moses did when he chose Joshua. And this is what Joshua did when he sent the two spies in. He chose two young men. In fact, the Old Testament is filled with references to young people. Now, in case you young people did not know how often you are referred to in the Bible. Let me just give you some references from the Old Testament, and you will know immediately that they are talking about young people. All right? Listen to this. According to Judges 14, verse 10, young men like to party. 
And your parents are saying, that doesn't say that in there. Well, you look it up. It's Judges 14.10. Young men like to party. Ruth chapter 2, verse 9. Young men like young women. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 17. Young men like to sin a lot. 1 Samuel 30, verse 17. Young men like to ride fast camels. <laughs> it's in there. Fast, they didn't have fast cars, but they had fast camels. In 1 Kings 12, young men sometimes give foolish advice. They're young men. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 10 through 13, young women give good directions. Of course, young men don't pay any attention to them. Job chapter 29, verse 5, young men have respect for older men. Ezekiel 23, verse 6, young men love riding horses. Esther 2, verse 8, young women love beauty pageants. And the verse that we've been looking at again and again from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, verse 6, and following, when Ananias and Sapphira played fast and loose with their promises to God, and they died, the young men carried them out and buried them. Young men became pallbearers. You see, sometimes I think those of us that are older overlook the fact that the Bible has a lot to say about what young people were charged to do throughout the history of the church. When 33 different kings surrounded the capital of Samaria, Israel's capital to the north, Israel's frightened king asked the Lord who could deliver him. And the Lord's answer, 1 Kings 20, verse 14, the young leaders of the provinces, they will deliver you. The young men. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30 and 31, even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings with eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even the young people need to wait upon the Lord. And there is no time of life more difficult to wait than when you're young. So the Bible addresses young people throughout the pages. Jeremiah 31, 31, 13 says, speaks of a future day when Israel was restored. And it says, then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance and the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy. Now I want to make a comment here. And I want you to notice how often, young people, when the Bible refers to young men and young women, it calls the young women the virgins and the young men, young men. Now you put that on the sticky side of your mind because we'll encounter that more than once tonight. For the time being, Jeremiah describes the destroyed city of Jerusalem where Zion spreads out her hands, but no one comforts her. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. That's the book of Lamentations. And in Amos chapter 8, verse 13, it predicts a day of judgment when in that day the fair virgins and strong young men shall faint from thirst. In the mind of God, young women are always thought of as young virgins. It wasn't in the mind of God for young women to give away their virginity. That was never the plan of God. It was always the plan of God for him to give virginity as a gift to young women and to young men. And when they met that very special person that God brought into their lives, 
That was the gift they gave to each other. Well, the Bible's filled with references, as I say, to young men and young women. Uh, There are some verses in the Psalms about how young men would give thanksgiving to God. Psalm 71, verse 17, for example. There are verses in Ecclesiastes about the wisdom of young men. There's some advice given in the Bible to young men. Ecclesiastes 12, 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. The Bible is just chock full of references to young men and young virgins. Still, quite often, even in the society of the Bible, young men and young women were looked upon as uh, inexperienced, uh, unable to perform tasks that older people should be performing. And and sometimes uh, this rubs off on a young person. They have abilities, and they want to be used by God, but, you know, us older people, the gray hairs, are the ones that fill all the responsible places. And yet, listen to this, 1 Samuel 17, verse 33. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he was a man of war from his youth. Now, just think about that. The king is saying to David, you're just a boy. You can't do this. Well, you know the story, of course. You're right, David couldn't do that. But God could, and God could do it through a young boy. In fact, 1 Samuel 17, verse 42, when the Philistine saw David, when Goliath saw David. This is what he said. He disdained him, for he was only a youth. He disdained him. Now, let me say to you young people something I told the pastors last Saturday morning. Everything God ever asked me to do, people said I was too young to do it. Everything. I became a college president at age 35. Everyone said, you're too young. And I said, yeah, you're probably right. I entered the classroom as a teacher at age 24. Some of my students were older than I was. They said, you're too young. I said, yeah, that's probably right. I came to back to the Bible at age 45 and found out I was going to speak into a microphone and people were going to hear me all over the world. And everyone said, you're too young. And I said, yeah, that's probably true. I got to tell you, I really miss that now. (laughs) I haven't had anybody tell me I was too young in a lot of years now. So, young people, in the book of Acts, young men and young women were active in the service of the Lord. How is it then? How do we we raise another generation of champions like the first century church did, like the people of God, Israel, did in the Old Testament? How in our 21st century, from our churches, From this group tonight, how does God select a champion and raise him or her to stand before the world and proclaim Jesus Christ? How does that happen? Well, wise adults always champion young people. And I think we can learn a lot from David's advice to his son Solomon, which was read as a part of our scripture tonight from 1 Chronicles chapter 28. If you have a Bible there, let's go from the book of Acts and to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. I'm not going to reread what was read earlier. You've heard the story and you probably know the story. But I do want to refresh your mind what David said to his son when Solomon was still a relatively young man And David wanted to make sure that Solomon would be an achiever for God. David was worried, perhaps, that Solomon would be an underachiever. David assembles all the leaders of Israel, as the passage says, gets them all together, 
allows Israel to witness the passing of the baton from David, the wonderful king of Israel, to Solomon, his son and heir to the throne. This is what it says. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 1, David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem, the officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of the thousands, and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the property and the livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with all the palace officials, the warriors, and all the brave fighting men. Now, that's just the Bible's way of saying everybody was there. Everybody was there. Because David was doing something all of us in ministry have to do at some point. And that is we have to entrust what God entrusted to us to those who will follow us. I am interested tonight, young people, in you knowing that your pastor, your parents, Keswick, the church in Jamaica is very interested in you being a champion for the Lord God. Not just a servant, but a champion. God needs champions in Jamaica, now more than ever. So David gets everybody together, and when you get down to verse 20 of this passage, 1 Chronicles 28 at verse 20. Listen what happens here. 1 Chronicles 28, 20. David also said to Solomon his son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Now listen, when you begin your work for the Lord, and you young people are right at the prime age to be thinking about this, you need to have the advice emblazoned in your mind, as well as your heart, that there are certain characteristics of champions that are true in the Old Testament, they were true in the book of Acts, and they are true in Jamaica tonight. And I want to notice with you out of this passage, chapter 28, verse 20 and following, I want you to see exactly what it is that David says to his son that makes a champion. Because what David was doing is exactly what Paul did with Timothy. What David was doing is what Barnabas did with John Mark. What David was doing is what Peter did with Mark and Paul did with Titus and others. This is a pattern of God entrusting to young people the service of the Lord for future generations. So notice in verse 20, this is what King David says to his son makes a champion. Verse 20, David also said to Solomon, be strong and courageous. Now, I want to say to young people tonight, God is looking for men and women who have courage. And courage doesn't come easy in our world today because there is such a tremendous threat against what we believe as Christians. There is pressure on young people today like was never true in you older folks' generations. They need more courage than any Jamaican has needed in any time in the past. And I believe they can have that courage because it comes from God. And what David is saying to his son Solomon here is, I want you to be a man of courage. And I say to you young people tonight, be a woman of courage. Be a man of courage. There's a long history of battle-scarred generals giving encouragement to young soldiers just so the battle can continue. Think about this. Moses said to the 12 spies that went into the land, be of good courage and bring some fruit back from the land. I love that. Be of courage and bring me some mangoes back. 
Be of courage and bring back some fruit. Don't come back with stories. Come back with fruit. Don't come back saying we tried. Come back with fruit. Be men and women of courage. Moses himself said to Joshua, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. In other words, be people of courage. Don't fear and don't get discouraged. That's Moses to Joshua. And just in case you missed it in your reading of the book of Joshua, let me read a few verses out of the first chapter. Joshua is receiving the same kind of encouragement from the Lord God. Why? Because he was a young leader. And in Joshua chapter 1, this man, Joshua, is understanding exactly what it means to be encouraged by God. Listen to this. Joshua chapter 1, and let me read just a couple of verses. Joshua 1, beginning at the very first verse, Joshua 1, 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, for the benefit of all those of you who are teenagers here, or you're 24, or 22, or 25, you're young. Most of your life is still ahead of you. I want you to look back across the page into the book preceding Joshua, into the end of the book of Deuteronomy. This is what the word of the Lord says about Moses, the great leader. Listen, I'm going to read from verse 10. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all these signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And Joshua, you're up next. I mean, what a eulogy. No one has ever done what Moses did. The greatest man in the history of Israel. But unless you think that the greatest generations are behind us, go on to the next page and look at chapter 1 of Joshua, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. It's almost matter of fact. Moses is the greatest man who ever lived. Well, he's dead. Let's move on now. The day comes when God suddenly says to young people, it's your turn, and I need you to step up. I need you to step up. After the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. Skip down to verse 6. He says, be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. That's God speaking to a young man who is about to take over from the great Moses. One other verse. Look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, you can't help but notice how often he says pretty much the same thing. I don't want you to be afraid, 
but I do want you to be strong. If you are strong, you will not be afraid. But if you are not strong, you will not be successful because you will be afraid. Now, you and I face a world that is pretty antagonistic to the gospel, pretty antagonistic to the Lord Jesus. And tonight, God is begging every young person in this room, be strong and do not be afraid. Now, fear comes in various categories. There are various kinds of fear. You know, there's the fear of uh, dread. Some people dread certain things. You may have a dread of spiders or snakes or something like that. The number one fear in the world is the fear of public speaking, standing up for an audience and speaking. Obviously, some of us people would say, sit down, that's enough. Another fear is, is anxiety. You don't know what the trouble is. You're just worried about it anyway, you know. You're worrying about the results of an exam, or you're worrying about this, or worrying about that. That's a kind of fear. But that's not the kind of fear he's talking about here. Another kind of fear is just plain being scared, just being afraid. We all have those fears, don't we? There are things that scare us to death. I remember when I was about... Oh, maybe eight years old. My mother and father uh, had built their own home, and they did not finish the upper level of the house. I had an older brother who was two years older, so he was ten and I was eight. And uh, my mother and father and uh, my brother and I had been working upstairs, trying to complete more of the upstairs, and my mother failed to bring her kitchen broom down one day. So at night, after everything was dark, she sent my brother and me upstairs to get this kitchen broom. Now that doesn't sound so fearful, except for this. This is one of those houses that had those areas, you know, that used to shoot off where there were windows, dormers. And it was dark back in those dormers. We had no idea what was lurking back in there. I was eight, he was 10. And what's worse, there was only one tiny light bulb hanging from a wire in the middle of the room, and it gave off very little light. So we were going up into this inky mess, and we had to go up the stairs this way, and the broom was all the way on the other end of the house, and there was no flooring upstairs, just the joist. And we had to walk, stepping on these joists, Gingerly, because if we missed one, we'd go through the ceiling downstairs. So she sent my brother and me up into this terrible situation to get a broom. I'm guessing we were 10 and 8. My father and she were young. She thought, it's all right. We can have more children if we need to. <laughs> we'll send them up to get the broom. Now, here's the thing. At the bottom of the steps, there was a light switch. And when you switched on that light, all the electricity upstairs came on. Only one light. But we had an old radio at the other end of the house near the broom. And for those of you who were born and raised on iPhones, radios long before your time not only were portable, but before that, they actually had tubes in them. Big tubes, so you could replace a tube if it burned out. You would plug it in the wall, turn it on, and it took a while for the tube to warm up before the radio would work. So at age eight and 10, my brother and I flipped the switch. We walked up the stairs this way, we, in great fear, began to make our way across the joist till we got to the other end of the room in the darkness where the broom was. And by this point, the radio warmed up. <laughs> and the CBS Mystery Theater was on that night. 
We made our way up the stairs. We walked carefully across the joist, scared to death already. We reached out for that broom, and just as we did, the radio warmed up the tubes, and a sinister voice said, you touch that, you're a dead man. <laughs> now, um, I don't think we hit three joists on the way back, <laughs> or two steps all the way down. And the worst part is, we forgot the broom. <laughs> that was my experience at learning the true meaning of fear. And yet God says to Moses, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. God says to Joshua, don't be afraid, I'll be with you. God says to you young people tonight, don't be afraid. I'm not going anywhere. Don't fear, but be men and women of courage. Psalm 27, verse 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, that's a hard lesson to learn when you're young, isn't it? In fact, it's a hard lesson to learn when you're not young. I want you to listen as I read a passage to you from Deuteronomy. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. He knows that they're going to face, in their trek across the desert and in their conquest of the land, those who eventually would go in, he knows they're going to face an incredible amount of obstacles. So listen very carefully what to Moses says. He says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and you see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. Do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to save you. What a promise. The Lord God goes with you to fight for you to save you from your enemies. But he isn't finished yet. Verse 8 says, The officers shall speak further to the people and say, What man is there among you who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house lest his heart make his brethren faint like his heart. You know what he's saying? That's Deuteronomy chapter 20. You know what he's saying? He's saying if you go out to do battle for the Lord and you're afraid, would you do all of us a favor and go home? Because nothing is so contagious as discouragement, right? Listen, if you're here tonight and you're discouraged, do me a favor. Please don't shake my hand. I don't want any discouragement to rub off on me. We are fighting for the Lord, but more importantly, He is fighting for us. Be men and women of courage. Young people, it's going to take courage for you to rise up and be the champion that God wants you to be. Well, that's what David says to his son Solomon. That's not all that he says, however. Back in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, he says to his son Solomon, be of good courage, but he also says this in verse 20, the second half of verse 20, he says, 
Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord has finished. He says, don't just be men and women of courage. God needs men and women of conviction as well. Now, what does he mean by that? See, God's champions always believe the promises of God. They don't need proof. They have God. Why do they need proof? God has a track record. God makes only three kinds of promises. Remember this. Only three. God has made promises that he's already kept. God has made promises that he's keeping right now, today. And God has made promises he will keep in the future. And since he has a track record in the past and we can see what he's doing today, you young people can trust that God will keep his promises to you as well. He is a God who keeps his promises. So he's asking you to be men and women of conviction. Believe that God will do through you things that you can't even dream today. Before entering the promised land, God said this to Joshua. He said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And as you well know, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13 takes those same words and he applies them to the Lord Jesus. I will not leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. Be convicted that I will keep my promises to you. See, without this combination of courage and conviction, no one ever accomplishes great things for God. All their people talk about them. But the ones who get things done are always men and women of courage and men and women of conviction. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, At my first defense... No one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But then he says this, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Listen, young man, asked about the time you think you've stood up for the Lord, you've done the right thing, and no one is on your side. They've all abandoned you. Remember, the Lord stands with you. Listen, young lady, just about the time you think that the pressure is too great on you and you have to give in to the pressures of others around you, remember, the Lord stands with you. Be men and women of conviction. Believe the promises of God and claim them and live by them. Be men and women of courage. Be men and women of conviction. And finally, did you notice the last part of that verse? He says, God will not forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. Be men and women of completion as well. Don't start a race and quit. Don't start serving the Lord and say, it's too hard, I quit. All of God's champions are men and women who finish what God gives them to do. Now, they may be beaten up and bloodied, but they know God will see them all the way to the end, and they will complete what God charges to them. You see, underachievers... Underachievers leave things incomplete. Sometimes even overachievers leave things incomplete. You're familiar with Franz Schubert, who was a well-known musician. Franz Schubert had a symphony that we all remember because it's called the Unfinished Symphony, right? Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. Do you know, most people think, well, the reason Schubert didn't finish it is because he died. That isn't true. Schubert lived six years. 
He did the first movement and the second movement, and instead of finishing the third movement, he just left it go, lived for six more years, and never completed that symphony. The great sculptor Michelangelo, who created some of the most beautiful sculptures in the world, left six unfinished sculptures. One day I was in northern Italy and I was in a garden and there was an ugly piece of stone. And I said to someone, why do you have that ugly piece of stone in the garden? I said, well, that's done by Michelangelo. I'm thinking, I could do that good with a hammer. <laughs> and then they explained to me, Michelangelo never finished it. It's one of the six. Now, you may have some projects around your house that you have not yet finished. It's just characteristic of us as human beings, isn't it, to leave things unfinished. My father built a garage when I was um, a young teenager. He lived in his house for another, oh, 30 years or so after that. And I remember when the garage was built, we painted the front side, we painted both sides, but we ran out of paint before we got to the back side of the garage. Thirty years after that, when I would go back and visit, I'd look at the back side of that garage and say, we've got to paint that someday. <laughs> it was left unfinished all of my father's life. It never got painted. Now, lots of you teens right now have unfinished homework. <laughs> and you're saying, eh, no, don't get on me about that. It's only Friday night. I'll finish it Monday morning. <laughs> I have several incomplete manuscripts of books. I started writing, and another project seemed to take precedent over it, so I put it in the file. And, and they're still there, and probably will stay still there. But remember, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. But God has promised to lift you up and strengthen you. Just have courage. Just be people of conviction and make sure you complete what God charges you to do. God told Solomon to build the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 says, So all the work that Solomon had done of the house of the Lord was finished. He did the work. He completed it. God told Moses and the Israelites to assemble the tabernacle. Exodus 39, verse 32. Thus, all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. If they hadn't completed the tabernacle, there never would have been the temple. And what a pickle you and I would be in tonight if Jesus could not have said on the cross, it is finished. Be men and women of completion. Don't opt out of what God asks you to do. I ran across this little poem some years ago, and it was always an encouragement to me. I hope it will be to you as well. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is strange with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns, and many a failure turns about what he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. Be men and women of courage. Be men and women of conviction. Be men and women of completion. God is looking for champions in this room tonight. 
And you may well be the champion God is looking for. We will know that you are that champion, as will you know that you are that champion, if the things that David said to his son Solomon can be said to you tonight and you accept the challenge to be a champion for God. You know, in every generation, the church continues because champions are raised up in every generation. Decades ago, godly men and women handed the baton to the next generation. At one point, someone handed it to me. I was inexperienced. I was unsure. Well, let me be honest. I was scared to death. Never did I envision that God would do with me what he chose to do. To quote David in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young and now I am old. So I want to say to those of you who are young, God needs you. Oh, God can get along without you, of course. But the church needs you. Your country needs you. Others of your friends need you because God needs champions, and you may just be the champion God needs. I remember reading a story once when I was studying a history course. Robert Moffat was uh, just a wonderful missionary to South Africa. He was from England, from Scotland, actually. And one time, Robert Moffat returned home to his native Scotland to, to recruit younger workers to go back to Africa with him. And when he got home, he met a cold, bitter winter in Scotland. He arrived at the church where he was to speak that night, and his goal was to recruit young people to go back with him to Africa. That was his goal. But when he got there, the winter was so harsh that only a handful of people showed up, and all of them were old ladies. There's no way they were going to uproot and go to Africa as missionaries, and Robert Moffat thought, oh my goodness. I'm going to be a total failure tonight. But he preached his sermon anywhere to these, anyway to these ladies, and Dr. Moffat felt absolutely hopeless. His message was taken from the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 4. This is what it says. Unto you, O men, I call. That's it. Unto you, O men, I call. And there were these little old ladies there. Well, what Moffat did not know was that in order for them to sing any hymns that night, they had to have someone work the bellows on the old organ. They had to work bellows in order to pump the air into the organ so that they could make music. And a young boy was there simply to uh, pump the bellows. And when Robert Moffat that night preached, Oh, men to you I call, that young boy heard the call. He came to the front of the church that night to give his life to the Lord in service. He had no idea what the Lord would do with him. And yet the Lord chose to use this one boy, this one little boy. He went off to further his education. He obtained a degree in medicine. He obtained a degree in music. He obtained a degree in theology, all from an institution I attended, the University of Strasbourg in France. And after that, this young man set off for Africa to be a missionary. God was really good to Robert Moffat that night, even though he thought he was a great failure, because the name of that young boy was David Livingston who gave his life, not as an explorer in Africa, but as a servant of the great king. That was Livingston's night. My young friend, this is your night. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Would you please shut everyone out of your life right now? Bow your head, close your eyes, 
and forget that you're in a room filled with people. Now, God is interested in us at any age of our life. I've seen God call people who were 50, 60, 70 to serve him in a new and unique way. One of the most profitable fields of missions today is the field where retired people who have certain skills say, I'm not going to sit around in my rocking chair. I'm going to serve the Lord. So I would never exclude those of you who are not young here tonight. But I do want to speak directly to you who are young. Listen to me, young person. What you are now is not what God wants to make of you. Because what you are now will determine what God will make of you. So God is looking for you. And this is the time for you to offer your life to God, just like David Livingston offered his life to God. This is the time for you to make a commitment to God, a commitment that you will be whatever he wants you to be, a commitment that you will go wherever he wants you to go, and that may be right here in Kingston. A commitment that you will do with your life whatever God wants you to do with your life. This is your time. This is time for you to make your commitment to God. Now, before you do that, however, I want to say something very clear and very strong to you. Young people often make a commitment filled with emotion. They get excited, they come to the front, they say, I'm going to serve the Lord, and it doesn't last because it was only a commitment made by emotion. Sometimes we trump up that emotion even in church. But what is done by emotion doesn't last. I'm not going to appeal to your emotions tonight. I'm going to appeal to your brain. Now, I didn't say heart, I said brain. Because you serve the Lord not just with your heart, you serve him with your brain. The brain is the gateway to the heart. That's why Paul so often reminds us that we need to have our minds renewed. We need to have the mind of Christ. This is a decision that you will make with your heart, but you also will make it with your brain. I want you to give your brain to God tonight, just as you give your heart to him. I want you to say, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but here I am, my hands, my heart, my head, everything. It may be to become a doctor. It may be to be a lawyer. It may be to be a computer analyst. It may be to be a missionary or a pastor. It may be to be a mom who raises children in the nurture of the Lord. Whatever it is, I'm asking you tonight to be a champion, to step up here, now. Be a man or a woman of courage and commitment and completion. I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to do something before I pray. John is at the piano, and I'm going to ask him to play something very soft and very easy. But if you were here tonight, and especially you young people here tonight, I was your age when someone gave me the opportunity to get up out of my seat and come and stand down front and say publicly to everyone who is in that auditorium, I am giving my life to the Lord Jesus forever. You're here tonight, and you're able to do that. I'm going to ask you just simply to get up out of your seat, ask someone to excuse you as you pass in front of them, and come and stand down here.
right in the front. I want to pray with you. Now notice, I didn't say if you were willing to do that. Willing is an emotional thing. I ask if you were able to do that. You are able if you have clean hands and a pure heart. God is not looking for talent as much as he is looking for you. You say, well, I don't have much to give God. Well, you're probably right. Neither did I. But as I say, what you are now is not what God will make of you. So as John plays silently, if you want to drive a stake down in your life, a place that you could come back to in 40 years or 50 years or 60 years and say, there it was, that night I stepped up to be a champion, I invite you to get right out of your seat right now and come down and stand right here. One of our Keswick folks will join you. They will pray with you. They will help you in any way they can, but they cannot help those except those who want to be champions. Will you do it? Will you come tonight and stake a claim in the kingdom of God by saying, I am willing to be a champion? And I don't know what that means, but I know it means me. In the quietness of this moment, no emotion, this is a serious commitment to the Lord that I only want serious people to make. You get up out of your seat, excuse yourself, come stand down front with these here and join them and say, I will serve the Lord. I was your age when I did it and I never look back, and neither will you. And you don't have to be young to do this. You don't have to be a teenager. I'm speaking specifically to teenagers tonight, but if this is the stake you want to drive down, you come and join us here at the front. Teenager, this is your night to become a champion. We'll wait for you as John plays. David had three mighty men. They were champions. They were people who said, you know, the task is going to be tough, but God and I are up for it. And they did some pretty amazing things. Will you be one of them tonight? Come, stand here with these. Become a champion. God's waiting for you. This is your night. This is your time. This is your place. The church needs you. It's one thing to sing about being a champion. It's another thing to take a stand and become one. So let me encourage you to go beyond singing. Let me encourage you to take a stand. Make a commitment like champions always do. Come and say, here I am, Lord. Use me however you want to use me. We'll wait for you, but don't linger. Because champions don't wait to the end of the line. They are the line. Come and join these. In the quietness of this moment, you're doing business with God. This is his business and yours. That's why I've asked you to close your eyes, because this is just between champions and God. I want to pray with you in a moment, but I want to give you the opportunity to make a public stand that you will serve the Lord. Young, old, doesn't matter. Even though I've been speaking to young tonight, you don't have to be a teenager to be a courageous person. Just come and stand here. Join these who have already come. Up there in the balcony, I know it's a long way away. 
and you're crowded up there, I understand. But you know what? It was crowded in the Valley of Elah when David stepped up and said, God and I can take this big guy. And that day, David became a champion. So let me encourage you, even if you're up in the balcony, we'll wait, come down, join these others who are here in the front. Thank you all for coming. We'll wait. It's too important. The future of the church is too important for us to let this night go by. Jamaica is too important to let this night go by without identifying some champions who will step up and become the next generation leaders of the church here in Jamaica. And God may do things with you you don't even know is possible. I grew up on a chicken farm. And I said, Lord, there's nothing I have to give you. And he said, I know. Just give me yourself. I'll make something out of that. You come. They continue to come. You join them. If God speaks to you tonight, not out of emotion, but if you say, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready. This is my time. This is my night. This is the place where I'm going to drive down a stake and say, I will be a courageous champion for God. They're still coming. We'll wait for you. Don't lose the opportunity. This is your night. It's not just youth night. It's your night. It's the night where God identifies champions. We'd like you to be one of them. We're waiting because others are still coming. Thank you for this courageous step. Should you be one joining them? If you are, do not fear, do not be afraid. Be courageous. Show your commitment to God. If you're a pastor here tonight and one of these folks standing in the front is in your congregation, feel free to get up and come and stand with them. If you serve the Lord in your local church, there's someone here that you could stand with and pray with. Please come and join them. This is where God does his business. He did his business with me a lot of years ago in a meeting just like this. And I was too young to be used of God to do anything, I thought. And others did as well. The only, the real person I had on my side, the only one was God. He said, look, if you give me the opportunity, I'll give you opportunities you never dreamed possible. We're about to pray. If you're planning to come, come now. That's it. We'll wait for you. Will you folks standing in front just bow with the others as I pray for you? Father, there is no greater privilege in life than to be clay in the potter's hands. We come to you, Lord, as just a chunk of clay. 
And sometimes, Father, we present ourselves to you and there are uh, little pieces of impurities in our clay, little sins, little unknown things in our lives that you have to rid us from. That's why we come, Lord, to offer ourselves to you wholeheartedly and forever. These dear folks have come, young and not so young, to give themselves to you. Now, they don't know what you're going to do with them, Lord. I don't know what you're going to do with them. But you do. Give them, Father, clean hands and a pure heart so that their lives offered to you are valuable to you. In our world, we're interested in talent. But you are interested in purity. So we offer ourselves to you tonight, Lord, these who are here and others. And we ask you, first of all, to cleanse them from every sin. Make them able to serve you. Lord, I appreciate their courage. It's not easy to get up from an audience and come and stand in the front, especially when there's no physical attraction to do so, especially when there's no emotional charge to come. There's just you and them. Thank you for them, Father. Thank you for their courage. They're going to need that courage, Lord, so we pray that you give them more. Make them even more courageous in the days to come. Give them, Lord, the commitment to believe your promises even when others do not. Even when others say those promises are not true, you're a fool for believing God. Give them commitment, Father, to believe what you have said to them. And Lord, help them to become people who finish the task you give to them. That task, Lord, may be three months long. It may be three years. It could be 30 years. But whatever it is, Lord, we ask you to help them complete the task. Now, Father, I present them to you, a gift from your church to you, people who want to be used by you. I pray, Father, that not only will you make them courageous and a people of commitment and completion, but you will use them in ways, Lord, they can't even dream tonight. Lord, I pray that perhaps a prime minister of this country is standing right here tonight, Lord. Perhaps the next great preacher or evangelist from Jamaica is here. Perhaps those who will lead the revival for this nation are standing right here tonight, giving themselves wholly to you. Father, thank you for them. Thank you for their commitment to you. Guard them. Put your angel watch around them. Keep the evil one bound from them so that they may be pure vessels in service to you. Thank you for them, Father. And for those who have made it possible for them to be here tonight and to live a life that pleases you, Lord, make of them champions. We give them to you, Father, as the gift of your church back to you. We give them in service throughout their entire lives. Use them mightily, Lord, and may they ever, forever remember this night when they drove down a stake and they said, Here I am, Lord. Use me. Thank you for them, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.